lead, educate, inspire, and win. Those are all things that great college coaches do when they mold young men. But the job of a college coach is one that rarely gets a second look. Win games and keep your job. You know, this day and age, that, that's almost, you almost have to win games um, because of the, the money involved and everything else, the media and everything else involved. So, so they go hand in hand. If you can do both, then, then you've done your job as a coach. I had a chance to sit down with the assistant coach on the basketball team, Melvin Watkins, and talk about the importance of communication to the profession of Division I coach. So you've got to have the, the ability to get kids to, one, listen to what you're, the message you're trying to get across, and, and two, to be able to carry that message out. So the level of communication needs to be there. Coach Melvin Watkins has been coaching for over 32 years, and he has spent time as both an assistant and a head coach. He has noticed a big difference in both those jobs. Well, the seat gets a little harder when you slide over one chair over. Uh, uh, having the opportunity to have done both, uh, you know, you become the decision makers uh, when you're that head coach and, and everyone is going to look at you, good or bad, uh, as, you know, that you let this kid go out and get in trouble or whatever the case may be, it's going to fall back on you. Another assistant coach, T.J. Cleveland, followed Coach Anderson when he was an assistant coach at Arkansas to where he is now. He has also noticed similar changes. Yes, he's, he's a lot more demanding. Um, in the assistant coach role, he was more of the comforting guy. When the head coach gets on you, um, he would come back and, and be the guy to pick you up and kind of encourage you. But now that's changed. He, he's that, that father figure that, that has to get on you, and us as assistants, we, we have to be the comforting and kind of the counsel on the team to, to keep encouraging guys that, hey, you, got, you just got to get better. Coach just pushing you to get better. Communication is the most important aspect of being a coach. But the thing is, there is no universal way to communicate. All we have are simple guidelines. Matthew Martin investigated the player-coach relationship and found out that verbal aggression is negatively related to motivation. So if you want to motivate, stay positive. Um, players... These, these guys, today, uh, these kids are smart. I mean, a lot of them are, are older when they come in, so they're a little more wiser, um, a little more mature. And those are the kids, they, they, they understand it. They appreciate it when you're more direct with them, and, and they respond better. Well, you've got to be flexible. Uh, you know, there are some times when a kid may have, let's say, had a tough day, whether it's in a classroom, on a basketball court, and you've got to read their expression sometimes. He may not need to be uh, ridden pretty hard that day. Uh, it may be a case where you might have to hug him sometimes and give him a little love, as we call it. Uh, so I, I think to be an effective coach and an effective leader, you've got to identify those who are trying to follow you, uh, what their needs may be in that particular situation on that particular day. And it but this is a fine line. As Marcia Wilson's research shows us, that the coach's behavior is congruent with his or her expectations of the athletes and that may lead to a perceived differential coach treatment. Uh, you know, you've got to be able to read one's face, and, 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 you know, it's not one of those situations where you're trying to show favoritism to any particular kid, but uh, kids' needs are different. Uh, their backgrounds are different. So if you can identify those things, I just think it helps you to be a better communicator and and, uh, and the bottom line is, I think it allows you to get more out of those kids when you can deal with the kid on an individual basis, knowing that we still have a team concept and, and that, you know, has got to be at the forefront. Team is the key word. As Andrea Baker examined Pat Summit, the all-time winningest coach in collegiate basketball history, and noticed that 55% of her behaviors were directed towards the team. Uh, we eat together. Sometimes we go to church together. Um, we, we want we want this this team to be like family. We want this whole this whole basketball program to be family, and we, we truly live that. Uh, you know, we try to make them feel like, hey, we we going to embrace every part of your life, and and try to get those people skills and your life skills to where once you leave here, you're going to be successful. Whether this being a good dad or or going out and getting a nine to five or playing, playing professional basketball. So it's very important that uh, family becomes a part of what you do. Uh, 
don't listen to how we say it, but what we say. And, you know, in other words, if I come in you at you and challenge you on the court sometimes, I may come at you with a tone that you be like, wow, coach, you really got after me. But listen to what I'm trying to tell you and the message I'm trying to get across. Sports are very highly competitive sports, and everybody, you know, gets get the juices flowing. So it can be some things that will be said out there sometimes that the average fan may not understand. Uh, but it's in the heat of battle, and sometimes those things can be effective in, in the way you may approach an athlete. The type of prayer players that we try to bring here on this campus, one that's going to understand that team first. Uh, you know, if you win in ball games, everybody loves a winner. If you win in ball games, uh, some of those other things will, will take care of themselves. And, and I think you go back to Damari Carroll. He helped us win ball games. Therefore, he ended up being a first-round draft pick. So uh, we're going to look at it from that standpoint. Now, there may be other players and other coaches do a little different, saying that, you know, uh, this individual player, you know, he represented this and that to the team. Uh, but there again, you got to be careful with that because, you know, the word team needs to come to the forefront. If you get too many individuals out there, you can you see if you look at college basketball, there are a lot of talented teams out there, but they may not win. Well, the question has to be why not? Well, some of that why not is because it begins to be a little bit more about that individual than, than the team. Well, I think once again, when you get feedback, and you see kids performing in the classroom, you see kids uh, being productive in the community. Uh, those things, I think, gives you an indication uh, besides, you know, doing what you need them to do out on the playing floor. Uh, th those things give you an indication that, you, you know, you're touching that kid in a positive way. And, uh, you know, so if you see that and you get those kind of feedbacks, when fans come and say, man, we really appreciate how your kids carry themselves when they're at the mall or at the theaters. Uh, that's, that's something that, uh, as a coach, you, you cherish those moments. Although communication is key to basketball, it is even more important to football, especially when it comes to calling plays on a college level. My high school, we had our quarterback run to the sideline, get the play, run back to the huddle and tell us to play. And it was just something that we knew, but now you got to know the play and what signal means that play. So. It's, it was a lot different, and coming in as a freshman, you had to learn that real quick. And the signals for play calls provide the team a luxury when it comes to calling plays. It also exponentially increases the chance of discourse. Well, it's definitely sometimes it's a frustration because um, sometimes the mic uh, or the headphones with the coaches when they're signaling in, they kind of cut out so the coach won't hear. So sometimes one of them, they'll get frustrated with the plays, or sometimes we'll, we won't see a signal. And so, like, for instance, if a play is uh, the same, exact same signal, but then a different play is the same signal, just with one thing added at the end, sometimes when we see the first of the play, then we're like, oh, we know what that is, and we turn away too fast, so we don't get it as a whole. Uh, so looking over there and constantly getting it from different coaches, that's something that I will hop out a lot, and obviously you need to get the play right. Despite the chance of discourse, the coaches work hard to limit the errors, but when they happen, it usually results in a touchdown. The odds is 100% right that you're going to get the play right. You know, if you don't get the play right, something can happen. So, I mean, probably 99% of the chance everyone's going to get the play right because we go over this type of stuff in practice and stuff like that. I mean, of course, there's going to be errors. Sometimes you just hope when there's errors, you know, nobody will notice it or, or they won't attack that actual person that makes the mistake. I, a personal example, um, when we were playing against Texas, um, we were playing against Texas and we were, everybody was communicating the call and it was a man call, but I thought, we were in zone, so I rolled, I ran a roll coverage and everybody else was playing man, and I thought I had coverage, I thought I had help over the top, but um, my, my safety, he was in man coverage, so because I thought he had, I thought I had help over the top, I didn't guard the man, and it was an easy touchdown.